in our last lecture we were looking at uh, matrix conditioning so matrix conditioning allows us to separate bad matrices from good matrices and we know when the calculations can go wrong because the matrix is bad and we are able to make a judgment on the quality of solution for linear algebraic equations so i gave a very simple example polynomial approximation some continuous function you are trying to approximate f of x f of z is some function which you are trying to approximate uh, and then if you develop an approximation which is uh, polynomial approximation then in polynomial approximations we have shown that you get equations of the type h theta is equal to u so h is the hilbert matrix theta is the parameter vector parameters of your polynomial coefficients and u is the depending upon how you have formulated the problem you will have you will be a, a vector which is a finite dimensional vector and this is this is exactly like solving ax equal to b x is theta b is u and a is matrix h and what i showed you last time was that h3 h3 is hilbert matrix which is 1 half 1/3 half 1/3 1/4 and uh well i'll just write this here okay so this is my h matrix okay and then i took a solution here i my right hand side my right hand side was 11 by 6 13 by 12 and 47 by 60 when theta is equal to 1 1 1 transpose okay when theta is equal to 1 1 1 1 unit vector 1 1 not unit vector one vector containing three 1 1 ones your right hand side will be this and this is the exact solution okay i just showed you how things can go wrong even for this matrix for which the condition number is not so bad the condition number we found here was 408 no we condition number we found here was 748 okay so for this particular matrix condition number c infinity or c infinity of h3 was 748 okay i just showed you how things can go wrong instead of solving this problem instead of solving the original problem we solved slightly modified version of this problem which is 1 1 1 Point three three three. Point five. Point three three three, and point two five.
this is my this matrix I would say is my uh, x 3 plus delta x 3 this matrix has a slight error right this matrix has a slight error as compared to the original matrix h 3. So, I, if I start doing computations with this matrix and instead of this u if I take slightly perturbed u which is 1.83 actually I have done is I have just truncated the fractions ok just truncated the fractions. Uh, 1.08 and 0.783 ok. So, this is my u plus delta u I just change I am just calling this u plus delta u because I am truncated I decided to truncate and write the same equation my solution changed so drastically 1.09. So, this is my theta plus delta theta ok this is my theta plus delta theta this is for a matrix for which you have condition number of 700 ok. So, actually if I try to estimate what is the fractional change that we have made on in H matrix or in U matrix it is of the order of 0.3 percent ok of the order of 0.3 percent change 0.3 percent error I can I can take I can find this error using norms norm of delta h 3 by norm of h 3 ok or norm of delta u divided by norm of u I can find out what is the percentage change if it, it is of the order of 0.3 percent ok. But the solution changes by almost 50 percent drastic change in the solution just because and here whatever you try to do you do maximal pivoting you do whatever reordering of the calculations you will get into trouble that is because this matrix is ill condition ok. Now, the example that we gave earlier that I gave you earlier 2 cross 2 example might lead you to believe that uh, it is something to do with singular matrices this is nothing to do with singularity. What matters here is the condition number condition number if you take in terms of 2 norm ok condition number is ratio or square root of ratio of the singular values of the matrix largest singular value by smallest singular value find angle values of a transpose a and take ratio of maximum eigen value of a transpose a by minimum eigen value of a transpose a find the square root that is what matters ok. If that ratio is small ok if that ratio is small matrix then the matrix is well conditioned that ratio is large ok individual eigen value may not be equal to 0. But if that ratio of the largest eigen value of a transpose a to smallest eigen value of a transpose a if that ratio is large matrix is ill condition and that is what can that can create problem for you using any sophisticated uh, program or any sophisticated computer it will create a problem for you. So, that is inherent problem with the matrix not the problem with the computer or the program ok. So, there is one more example which I have given here to uh, I will not write the numbers because the numbers are very small, but I have tried to show here in this example is that uh, very 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 simple example I think I demonstrated this to you this a matrix ok this simple a matrix 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9. Okay, this is not called by any any name. Just uh, this this particular matrix is highly ill-conditioned. Okay, condition number of this matrix it appears. What is there? You have just written one to nine 
numbers in the particular sequence. The condition number of this matrix, if you ask the condition number that is C2 of A, okay. So, which is square root of lambda max of A transpose A by lambda min. Okay, lambda min of A transpose A. Uh, this is this turns out to be three point eight one into ten to the power sixteen. Okay, condition number of this matrix is very very large. You can do a simple experiment in MATLAB or Scilab or any software. Take this matrix, okay? Find its inverse. Well, MATLAB, MATLAB will give you a warning. This matrix is highly ill-conditioned. The results may not be reliable. And you can check that. If you find inverse of this matrix, and what should happen if you find inverse of this matrix and multiply with it the matrix itself, you should get identity matrix, okay? If you do that, that experiment in numerical experiment in MATLAB, you will get matrix which has nothing to do with identity matrix. You will get some, some other matrix. You get, uh, you get numbers like 2, 8, 18 when you multiply A into A inverse for this matrix because this is highly ill conditioned matrix. Okay. And then I have given one more example, one more example. So, what I want to stress here is that inherently a given matrix is, uh, you know, every matrix will come a, come with its own characteristics, and then uh, uh, that will dictate how the calculations proceed. Okay, and you should be able to recognize bad matrices or ill-conditioned matrices. <coughs> okay, this is one more matrix I have shown here. Okay, for this matrix, if you do A into A inverse, you can do that experiment in MATLAB. You will get you will never get identity matrix, but I will give you another matrix in 10 to the power uh, minus 17, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, I have taken this matrix. Okay. Now, you might say that this matrix is, is it, is it like a null matrix? 10 to the power minus 17 into 1, 10 to the power minus 17 into 2, okay, it looks like a null matrix, right. All the, all the elements of this matrix are close to 0, though I have written here 1 to 1, it is multiplied by 10 to the power minus 17, okay. Now, if I do inversion of this matrix, okay, now, if I do inversion of this matrix and then multiply inverse of this matrix into B matrix, MATLAB will give you perfect identity matrix back. Why? Condition number of this matrix, even though this looks, this is a, this is like a null matrix, all elements are close to, close to 0, okay. The condition number of this matrix C2B, it turns out to be 5.474. Very well conditioned matrix, no problems with the calculations. Okay, that's because if you take B transpose B, find out its maximum eigenvalue, minimum eigenvalue. Take a ratio that will come out to be this, and square root of that. Square root of that. It will come out to be this. So this means uh, inherently you are not going to get into any trouble. When you do calculations with this matrix, which is close to null matrix, its eigenvalues are very close to 0, okay, that, that does not matter. What matters is the condition number, what matters is the ratio of maximum to minimum singular value, square root of, that is what dictates the calculations, okay. So, with this, we come to an end of discussion on linear algebraic equations. Uh, we looked at many things, we looked at, uh, I suppose you have learned much more than what you know 
about solving linear algebraic equations uh, as compared to your undergraduate uh, courses on AX equal to B. You probably thought you, have, you knew everything about AX equal to B, right? Gaussian elimination and then you are done. But what, what you see here is far, far more than what you know. We looked at sparse matrix methods, okay? efficient way of calculating. That too, I just could cover a few of them just to give you a taste of what it is. It is much more to it. There is a sparse matrix toolbox in MATLAB or Scilab. You know, there are many, many routines which exploit spatial structure of a matrix and do fast computations. The reason for introducing sparse matrix was to sensitize you that there exists something called sparse matrix computations. So, in your problem, in your MTech problem or PhD problem, when you hit upon large scale matrices, try to look for sparse matrix. Uh, you know, try to exploit sparsity if you can. You can make your computations very, very fast. Okay. Uh, then, you know, next thing we looked at was iterative methods. Iterative methods like Jacobi method, Gauss Seidel method, and so on. Okay. Iterative methods in general, it is difficult to prove, but in general, they work faster than, uh, you know, these Gaussian uh, elimination, particularly for large scale matrices. We looked at two classes of iterative methods. One was Gauss Seidel, those kind of methods. The other one was optimization based, gradient method, conjugate gradient method and so on. So, we looked at two classes. In particular, for Jacobi method and Gauss Seidel method, those kind of methods, we also analyzed the convergence behavior. When are you guaranteed to converge to a solution of Ax equal to b? Okay. So, we looked at convergence properties. We also looked at how to tweak my problem to ensure convergence. Okay. So, now we have broadened our base, our toolkit for solving Ax equal to b. We have many more methods now for solving Ax equal to b. Moreover, we know what really matters in iterative methods, eigenvalues. Eigenvalue problem, you know, probably unexpectedly propped up when you try to analyze this. Uh, it is not really unexpected. It is eigenvalue problems have come when you try to analyze linear difference equations. Uh, and then we related, you know, spectral radius. We related the maximum magnitude eigenvalue of certain matrix. If it is inside unit circle, we said that we are guaranteed convergence and so on. We also looked at some theorems to ensure convergence, right? So, and then finally, we moved to this matrix conditioning. Try to weed out good matrices and bad matrices, weed out bad matrices from the set of matrices. So, we know now how to, how to, you know, judge whether a matrix is bad and that is why the, that is why you are getting wrong answers or, you know, or your, uh, you know, problem formulation, the strategy for computing is bad and matrix is good, but you have made mistakes. So, you know where, where, how to distinguish between these two. So, with this, now you have a good idea of how to deal with Ax equal to b. Now, let us move on. Let us move on to solving nonlinear algebraic equations. So, that is what I am going to do next. I uploaded my notes. Okay. For this, so we now start with the next tool. So, let me draw the diagram again that just to bring you back to the entire theme of this course, we have this uh, original problem. We have this mathematical model and some problem which we cannot solve directly. So, we use this, okay, we had a mathematical model and some original problem that we wanted to solve. So, using approximation, using approximation theory, we transform this problem to a computable form, okay. And then we said we are going to look at four different tools or there are four different approaches typically to solve this problem. I am going to cover three of them. So, one is, one is solving A x equal to b, okay. It could be using this tool to solve this problem, okay. Or I could be using solving 
f of x equal to 0. It is quite likely that to do this I might be using this Newton's method. I am using a x equal to b to solve. Okay. So, this could be directly being used or it could be indirectly being used. I do not know. The third tool which the third tool is OD initial value problem solvers, IVP solvers, all this Euler method, Runge Kutta method. So, the third one which we are going to look at is that IVP solvers and of course, the fourth tool is the stochastic tool which stochastic tool, I am not going to look at the stochastic tool. So, this one, this one we are done with, I am moving to this tool now and towards the end of the course, we would be covering this, this will be left untouched because it probably would need one more course to cover stochastic tools and what you get here is the approximate solution. This is the approximate solution for the original problem that you get. So, this is done, we are moving to this, okay. eventually we will move to this and that is end of the course. So, this is, this is the overall structure just to get back on the, you know just to give you a global picture of what has been happening. Okay. So, now let us move on to f of x equal to 0, solving nonlinear algebraic equations. We have already done something about this, we have already derived Newton's method starting from Taylor series approximations, right. Now, you might wonder, well, I know Newton's method, what is there? Why do I need many more things? But just like Gaussian elimination is one way of solving linear algebraic equations, you will realize that Newton's method is just one approach. There are many ways of doing it and the reason why there are many ways of doing it is because there is no method which is panacea, you know, one method which works for everything. Sometimes one approach works better, sometimes the other approach works better. So, you have to you have to be ready with multiple tools and you know use appropriate tool whenever whenever required. In some cases, you do not require Newton's method. Some cases it is not possible to apply Newton's method because Newton's method requires Jacobian calculations. If I have 100 equations in 100 unknowns, okay, you have seen that kind of scenario in solving partial differential equations. Developing a matrix, even if it is numerically, developing a matrix 100 cross 100 at each iteration, it is painful, it is computationally intensive. And just imagine if you are trying to solve steady state simulation of a complete chemical plant, thousands of equations to be solved simultaneously, right? Thousands of equations uh, to be solved simultaneously. If you are trying to simulate a section of a plant, many, many thousand equations, nonlinear algebraic equations to be solved simultaneously. If you have to compute Jacobian, even numerically, okay, it is not an easy task. Okay. So, we have to see what has happened is as computers have become more and more, you know, uh, powerful, we are also trying to solve problems which are larger and larger problems. Okay. 25, 30 years back, probably nobody thought of uh, solving 1000 equations in 1000 unknowns in the classroom. Now, you can do it as a part of your assignment, okay, which would be probably an MTech thesis some time back. Uh, so, things have changed because of you know what we want to solve uh, with growing power of computer also has changed. <coughs> so, there are problems which earlier with slow computers would take days to solve. Well, now also there are problems uh, which take days to solve except what you are trying now is different from what you are trying earlier. Okay. So, even with very, very fast computers and very fast uh, good software, you still have problems which are and that will, that is, there is no end to this, you know, this will just keep on uh, growing. Okay. So, now let us look at different methods for solving nonlinear algebraic equations.
okay. So, I can now just work with abstract forms because you have seen many many examples where you have to solve nonlinear algebraic examples equations. So, my intention is to solve f i x equal to 0 where i goes from 1 to to n x belongs to r n ok or now we are comfortable with the notion of a function vector or I can write this into function vector f x is equal to 0 same problem right f x equal to 0 where f is a map from R n to R n. More sophisticated way of writing the same thing is that f is a function vector ok. You are trying to look for that value of x where f of x will give you 0 vector this is 0 vector f of x equal to 0 f is a map from R n to R n n dimension to n dimensions ok. So, these are the kind of equations that we are interested in solving ok. Uh, what would be what would be the simplest method? So, first of all you know uh, now well uh, for solving nonlinear algebraic equations except for some very very special cases where you can solve them analytically uh, if you remove those you know uh, small uh, set of problems where for example, you can solve uh, multidimensional quadratic equations simultaneously. You can construct just like you can solve one dimensional quadratic equation simultaneously, you can solve multivariable quadratic equations simultaneously. But these kind of analytical solutions are very, very few. In general, even if you have a polynomial of nth order in one variable, you cannot solve it analytically. Okay, it is very difficult to construct solutions or roots of that equation. Okay. So, we need uh, methods that can solve uh, nonlinear algebraic equations. Well, one thing I would uh, say is that if there are methods uh, which require less computations, better it is. Now, first of all, let us look at methods which do not require derivatives, derivative calculations. Okay. I want to solve f of x equal to 0 without having to compute derivatives or even if I have to compute derivatives, I can do it in some uh, simple way rather than computing entire Jacobian. So, I am going to give you a gradation of methods. Okay. Finally, we will of course, move to uh, Newton's method, but in Newton's method, you know the, the problem step in terms of large computations is um, Jacobian calculations. Okay. So, there are methods which can do what is called as a Jacobian update. Okay. So, Jacobian updates are do not require explicit differentiation. They try to construct an approximate Jacobian by using last value of the Jacobian and adding some correction because you have moved to a new point. Okay. These methods broadly called as Brydon updates or quasi Newton methods is also what we will look at. Okay. So, the first method class of methods I am going to call these are known as well uh, in iterative schemes everything is successive substitutions, but this class is also specially known as successive substitution methods. Um, what I mean here by successive substitution methods is uh, this subclass of uh, methods by which you do not have to compute any derivative. Okay, that is what I mean right now. In general, every method that we are looking at, iterative method is success of Okay, so the question is can I arrange can I arrange my calculations uh, in such a way that uh, you know I start with some initial guess x naught. Okay, I start with some initial guess x naught and then I generate a new guess then I generate a new guess from the old guess. Okay. I want to solve for f of x equal to 0. Okay. In some situations, in some problems for example, 
tubular reactor with axial mixing that problem which we have been taking uh, as a theme example throughout uh, the course okay uh, you can rearrange the these equations f of x equal to 0 into a special form a x is equal to g of x where a is a constant matrix a is a constant matrix and g is a some nonlinear function. So actually, so actually, if you want to see what is f of x, f of x is nothing but a x minus g x. Okay, trying to solve f of x equal to zero in this particular case reduces to this problem. In some cases, like tubular reactor, axial mixing, or some other piece, you might get naturally this kind of a form. Okay, another way of creating this form is just you know add x on both sides if i add x on both sides and call this as g of x okay so this is x is equal to g of x or i could do in general more some matrix here some matrix here bx is equal to so the you know the form is same the form is same so i can either do this transformation or in some cases the problem discretization will yield this kind of a form okay depending upon what kind of uh, structure the problem has so you get this this special form now what can i do with this So if I have this special form ax equal to ax is equal to g of x, okay, I could convert this into solving linear algebraic equations, okay, by a very very simple trick. So if I solve for, if I start with some initial guess, let x naught is my initial guess. x naught is my initial guess okay then what i'm going to do i'm going to solve for a x k plus 1 is equal to g of is everyone with me on this see i start with x 0 i start with x 0 if i substitute x 0 here i can compute this g of x this is known to me. What is not known to me? x k plus 1. x 1 is not known to me. But then it becomes a linear algebraic equation. This is this is b, this is a, this is a, a x equal to b. I can solve for x k plus 1. Then you know I can solve for x k plus 1 using any method uh, of a x equal to b, Gaussian elimination or Gauss serial method or whatever. Whatever. So, uh, so this will generate an iteration and when do you terminate? What is the advantage of doing this? I am not computing Jacobian. I am not computing Jacobian. So I will terminate my iterations when x k plus 1 minus okay so this is less than some epsilon. I will terminate when this becomes less than epsilon. I'll terminate my iterations. Okay, this method in general it looks very simple to formulate. No Jacobians. Okay, you can compute. Uh, uh, well, this method in some cases does work, and when we move on to uh, you know implicit methods for solving OD initial value problems, we'll see merit in using this method. Okay. What is very very critical here is that this method will converge if you give an initial guess which is very close to the solution. Okay. When will this method converge? How will it converge? We'll postpone that discussion to a little later part. I'll discuss about that uh, towards the end. At least I'll mention about it, though we cannot go too much into details. Uh, this particular this particular method, if you give a good initial guess, 
Okay, reasonable initial guess. This method will converge to the solution. Okay, generating good initial guess may not be always possible, particularly for large problems. If you have solving simulation for, you know, steady state simulation of an entire section of a plant, generating initial guess is no joke. It's quite difficult. Okay, so. Uh, it might be difficult to use it there, but in some small problems where you can generate initial guess uh, quite well. For example, uh, implicit Newton method or trapezoidal rule, where you can use explicit method to create a good guess for the implicit method. This method will work quite well. Okay, so this kind of. Now, uh, while implementing these kind of methods, I can also have variations which are similar to Jacobi method which are similar to Gauss-Seidel method, which are similar to relaxation method. So, I am now going to talk about variants of successive substitution method, which are like Jacobi method or which are like Gauss-Seidel method. Okay. So, when I do that, I cannot of course use this vector matrix rotation. What we did in Jacobi method? We went equation by equation. You remember? We went equation by equation. So, the same thing I am going to do here. Uh, so, I go back to my, I go back to my uh, original form. So, instead of writing, instead of writing the equation that I want to solve, I am going to rearrange into this form. x i is equal to g i x for i is equal to 1, 2, Okay, where where g of x is nothing but g one x, g two x. This small g is nothing but one element in the function vector. Okay, I am looking at element by element. I am looking at element by element. Converting into this form is not difficult. I can pre-multiply both the sides by a inverse. So, it will be x is equal to, okay. removing a matrix is not a, not a big deal. Okay. So, now suppose I have this equation and then how will you form Jacobi like iterations? My Jacobi iterations will be x i k plus 1 is equal to g i of x k. Okay, I am going to use the old value and create new value. Okay, for i is equal to 1, 2, n. How will you create Gauss Seidel like iterations? Use the new value as it gets created. Okay, so so, Gauss Seidel iterations is a concept. You can use it in context of linear algebraic equations. You can use it in the context of nonlinear algebraic equations. If you understand the concept, you can do relaxation iterations. So same, same ideas. Okay. So, my first equation will be x1 k plus 1 is equal to g1 xk. This is my first equation. Okay. My second equation that is x 2 k plus 1 will be g 2. Now, here I will use x 1 k plus 1. Okay. I will use x 2 k x 3 k x n k. Well, unlike the linear algebraic equation, x 2 will appear on both sides because these are nonlinear equations. You may not be able to separate them. What will be my x 3 k? k plus 1. This will use g 3 x 1 k plus 1 x 2 k plus 1 x 3 k. Is this clear? See, as and when the new value gets created, I am using it in the next, next equation. I am solving n equation equation by equation. Okay? I am solving equation by equation. 
okay one equation at a time okay this would be gauss theorem iteration okay and i can write a generic form for this okay for ith case you use new values up to i minus 1 and old values for i to n okay so you can write a generic form for this how will you create the iteration for relaxation method x nu will be x k plus omega times omega times the gauss seidel step where omega is greater than 1 or less than 1 depending upon here it is difficult to say whether the convergence will occur between 0 to 2 and all that it, it's not possible to say here okay in linear case we could say that the we could give necessary sufficient conditions for convergence it is not possible to do that here okay uh, so inherently uh, you know because you are using the old value new value every time it generated one would expect that this gauss seidel iterations will converge faster than the uh, jacobi iterations and so on so this this iterations would be better in terms of convergence properties than this is this cannot be you know proved but at least you can uh, uh, you know hope that this correction will so one can one can devise relaxation iterations here by saying x i k plus 1 is equal to x i k plus omega times so you make one gauss seidel iteration choose an omega which is positive omega greater than 0 and create a new create a new guess which amplifies which amplifies the change predicted by the gaussian step gauss seidel step and so on so one can one can have all these kind of variations here <coughs> okay so these methods these methods are advantage of these methods is that no gradient evaluation no jacobian calculations okay the flip side is that they will converge if you have a good initial guess okay um, if it if without gradient calculations if you are if you are a good initial guess and if it works great you know you are able to save on computations you can do solve the equations very fast if not you will have to go for gradient based calculations now i want to talk about one method which is in between okay this method is this method will use gradient evaluations okay but will not uh, do the full jacobian okay will not do the full jacobian it only calculates some gradients and uh, so this particular method is called as wegstein method or multivariate secant method okay so let's let's move on to uh, now gradient based methods okay so in the class of derivative based methods we have already looked at newton's method okay now i am going to revisit newton's method for the univariate case why i am looking at this will become clear soon because of because i want to talk about this uh, intermediate method called wegstein method so the motivation comes from univariate methods so univariate method newton's method if i have f of x equal to 0 where x belongs to r i want to solve one variable equation f of x equal to 0 okay uh, newton's method of course if this function is differentiable you can write x k plus 1 is equal to x k minus f of x k divided by I can write this as f of x k by f prime x k derivative of f with respect to x okay uh, we can have a slight variation of this method this is the classical Newton's method
there is a slight variation of this method called secant method. In secant method, what we do is this f prime x k, we approximate this derivative, we approximate this derivative using last two iterates. Okay. So, we approximate this as f x k minus f x k minus 1 divided by this small variation is called a secant method where this f prime x k is replaced by an approximation of the derivative. Okay. Here this is not in the true sense uh, a good did not be a good approximation because delta x x k minus x k minus 1 need not be small. Okay. So, this may not be a good approximation, but this method works quite well for many simple problems. So, this variation is called a secant method where now to kick off the secant method you need two initial guesses not one initial guess. You need two initial guesses x 0 x 1 then you can create the next get x 2 starting from x 0 x 1 because this gradient calculation this gradient calculation will require x 0 x 1 then you compute the gradient from two initial guesses and then you can move on to the uh, you know the, the x 2 then from x 2 x 2 x 1 you can create x 3 from x 3 x 2 you can create x 4 and so on. Okay. So, uh, you start with two initial guesses x 0 x 1 create x 2 using x 2 x 1 create x 3 and so on. Okay. There is one more variation of this method called as regular falsi. Probably all these method names which I am talking about right now might be familiar to you from your BTEC uh, background because one variable Newton's method, secant method and regular falsi are typically taught uh, in the undergraduate curriculum. The slight variation Okay. This is based on the observation that if you have this is my x and I am plotting f of x. Okay. f of x has some behavior like this. I am looking for this point where f of x equal to 0. Right? I am looking for this point or I am looking for this point where f of x is equal to 0. I am looking for roots of the equation f of x equal to 0 which means I am looking for point where f of x reduces to 0, value of x for which f of x becomes 0. Okay. Now, one observation is that whenever there is an interval in which f of x has positive sign on one side and f of x has negative sign on the other side, f of x crosses 0. If f of x is a continuous function, okay, it will cross 0 somewhere at least once, it may be multiple times. Okay, we do not know, but it, at least once it crosses 0. Okay. So, this regular falsi method actually uh, tries to use this idea and makes a modification to secant method. Okay. So, it tries, it, it starts with two initial guesses. Okay. So, it will start with x0 and x1 such that function evaluated at x 0 and function evaluated at x 1 have opposite sign. Okay? Evaluated at x 0 and x 1 have opposite sign and then as it does proceed in the calculations, it tries to maintain this. Okay? It tries to maintain the fact that the two successive guesses should always have function values which are opposite sign. If that is maintained then convergence to the solution can be faster. Okay. So, this regular falsi, so this is where you know f of x k is greater than 0 and this is where f of x k is less than 0. If you have a scenario where uh, you know function value changes sign from positive to negative, this is only true for a one variable function not for difficult to say something like this for a multivariable function for one variable function, multivariable function vector, I am talking of 
one variable scalar function changes sign at two different points then there is a root somewhere in between okay that is the idea so uh, the modification here is that uh, i'll just i'll just write down this modification here cuz okay you carry out the iterations by this formula if it is less than 0 and a second case is uh so whether you use xk or whether you use xk minus 1 when you move forward okay to compute the derivative approximation okay that will be based on the sign of f of xk plus 1 which you get okay so when you go for the new iteration calculations you keep checking the sign and based on the sign you make a judgment as to how to proceed further so this is regular falsy approximation now what i'm going to do next is use this univariate method i'm going to use univariate secant method and create a multivariate secant method okay this multivariate secant method is called as wegstein method the advantage of multivariate secant method is that number of jacobians uh, or the num number of derivative calculations is very very small equal to number of equations whereas in newton's method the classical newton method you have to compute the full jacobian n cross n elements okay which can be quite large okay so if you see this software is like aspen plus they seem to be preferring this wegstein method which works quite well which is multivariate secant method so we'll look at it in our next lecture